Okay, I'm beginning to record. Go. Hello, my name is John Isak, and I know all of you. I'm sending this out to the Dancing Dots list that I have been lurking on for 30 years. <laughs> I've been around a lot, reading everything, reading it when I can, and I, I comment once in a while, but a great while. I figured I'd show you the workstation that um, DJX of great fame on this list helped me design. He designed it and pretty much mailed it to me and little piece by piece I put it together. Um, I built a whole desk and console around it and it's, it's not only just a workstation now, it can actually double as a control room for a little studio space which is soundproofed and quiet. Just, just to my left over here, I, I'm going to try and describe it for all the blind people like me who can't see this stuff. I'll try and make it somehow you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, we're facing the open end of a U. The desk is a U-shaped thing, very big, very large, and we're at the open end of it. And I'm going to now walk inside to where I would be sitting, where I normally would sit. I'm walking into the... the top of the U basically and the, the left part of the U on my left side faces a wall over here where it has a giant TV and on the left is the left speaker and the right is the right speaker and beyond that wall is the sound area the sound recording area a sound controlled room where musicians could sit and play the, in front of me is the main piece of equipment that I'll be using is a, a control surface it's a Mackey um, control surface. A lot of people don't know what a control surface is. Well, it, lots of regular sighted musicians use them, but they're especially good for blind people because we don't use a mouse, we don't use a monitor, obviously. So this imitates a mouse, basically. And it imit in other words, if you're gonna make something louder or softer in a music mix, you take your mouse and you find that volume lever or knob on the screen and you push it up, you drag it up or down. Since we can't do that, this control surface imitates that knob, but it, it attaches to real physical levers and knobs that we can turn. So this control surface does it all. It has 32 channels. I can record 32 channels or I can record hundreds and hundreds of tracks rather through all these, uh, all this equipment. And this thing has 32 tracks available simultaneously to play back. So I can mix them by turning knobs, pushing up the faders, and not having to worry about a mouse. I'll just hear the differences. Over here on the right side of this thing is a, a volume. It's a, a, a very nice little smooth running volume control. And also a thing that lets you rock back and forth. Um, through the mix that you're doing. You can go backwards and forwards and localize on one little area of it and then make something louder or softer and then go on and on. It's a, uh, a, great, a great system or a very nice transport that this Mackie has. I also want to tell you that these Mackies, I've never seen anything like it. Each one weighs about, I don't know, they're hard to lift up. They're so heavy. They're just made like tanks and Everyone knows Mackie's good sound. I'm not a commercial uh, for Mackie, or I'm not trying to say it's the greatest stuff in the world, but I think they did a good job on this thing. The problem is with all this recording equipment, even the digital stuff that's out now, you don't have a lot of analog cables running around and such, but you do have all the cables needed to make something like this work, which is an in and an out MIDI cable. And each one of these four extender pieces has a power cable. And then there's uh, some other foot switches available for over here. So all of them all is lots of cables. And um, if you were to look back here, you'd see three cables on the left side of each one of these Mackie extender, uh, eight channel extenders. I, I, did, I couldn't stand having all three cables of every extender sticking out the back and going somewhere down on the floor because th that amounts to about, <laughs> I don't know how many cables, but the problem is they each have a little, if you come down and look at the bottom of the desk, they each have a little, uh, you know, brick power supply with a cable going into the wall. And they're all quite annoying to have four or five of them behind your stuff and all the cables involved plugged into a big mess. 
it's horrible. So what I did, up on the top here, I took what's called pen, um, raceway or duct. This duct is, imagine a, a pipe, uh, actual, say, a, a two-inch pipe, and cut it in half. You'd have a hemispherical half of a pipe. Well, that has a, a bottom to it, and it's screwed to the desk. And the whole top lifts up. The hemispherical top lifts up. You can put all the wires you need along this ductway and close it nice and tight. So what I did was at the three wires coming out of the Mackies, I cut a little hole into that hemispherical pipe and I ran them in there and down along the desk and down a hole through the desk to the back where I put a very long power strip and all the, all the power adapters plug into a 10 position power strip. And they're all very neatly tied into ducts, so you do not see any cabling anywhere. You just see, the, by the way, this whole station is gray, I think, and the duct work is black. So it should look pretty nice to the people who care about that stuff. But what they're not seeing is a big jumble of terrible wires. Over here on the left of this Mackie control surface, I have a little speaker. And on the right, I have an, another little speaker and a big... Uh, bigger woofer that goes, it's an old Soundcraft setup where you have two speakers and a sound box. And I use that just simply for my jaws uh, because this system actually has a little volume control that comes out to where you can turn it up or down quickly. And I need to sometimes turn my jaws up and down quickly or shut it off to do whatever. Um, so I, I bring that volume control out to where this little device is. On the right of the control center, is a PreSonus um, monitor control center. It has about four inputs and outputs. I can set up different speakers to compare A and B with a big set of speakers, a little near field set of speakers um, or headphones. You can just switch between them quickly and do AV comparisons. Will the mix you do sound good in a big, big room? Will it sound good in a car? Will it sound good in headphones? You have to be aware of all that when you're recording. Anyway, so the basic system for JAWS and mixing is all here on this left side of the U. Now I'm going to the front side of the U, the actual bottom part of a U, a regular U character, and that's where a Soundcraft uh, mixer is. It's called a MT-22 or something. I'm not sure exactly what its model is. But it has 16 very high-quality mic channels and 16 real inputs and in about... Uh, you get, you get 22 channels of adding up all the stereo inputs and outputs and the various ways they do it. You can get a whole bunch of stuff going in and out of here, all analog. However, the guts of the thing is all digital. Um, all, everything in this place is digital. So once the, the sound comes in through a microphone or through a guitar or whatever analog device you plug in, or even digital device, it becomes digital to run around this studio. And so everything connecting all these pieces is just a USB cable. There's not 16 audio channels running around the room like it used to be, or just lots of extra weight. This has a great control on the right. You get four sub-channels. I won't get too technical, but it's a beautiful mixer, and I can record people live with this. The reason why I have it is not so much for its mixing capabilities, but Inside this is the interface to the computer. You need a digital interface. It's the actual device that takes the uh, digital information and sends it out MIDI to your computer. Your computer picks it up as a MIDI stream and deals with all those channels that way digitally. Um, on the right side of this U, which is uh, about four feet be between the front and the back end, I now have a, a, a Native Instruments 88 key keyboard, which has 50 or 60 knobs, switches, buttons, dials, and uh, et cetera on it, which I have to learn how to use. But right now I just know that it sounds great. And it, it has a, a very, very fine um, keyboard. It's weighted just like a grand piano. It's really well done. It, I don't know. Uh, how you could get all this packaged into one thing like this so so well, but they did a good job. Um, you can get these in smaller kinds of, like a 56 key keyboard, etc. but I bought a regular grand piano level thing. I play piano and I play drums. I wanted to have a shot at it, but at least having a full piano if I wanted one. 
But it, its main job is to make any sound in the world. It doesn't just have piano. It has lots of samples and stuff that are available with the software in the computer. But its main benefit to me is that it talks. By using the computer, it, if I turn a knob or pick a sound, like say I pick it, put it towards violins, I will hear Jaws tell me violins. If I press the button again and I go to tubas, it will goes to tubas. That's just inc incredibly difficult to do with any kind of a MIDI keyboard or s that doesn't do that. If, if, if your keyboard doesn't speak and all the other stuff does, you're lost. So this is just kind of puts it all together, this particular keyboard. Um, again, underneath I have all the same uh, tracking. The black tracking goes all around underneath the U. And I keep all the power in it one track by itself and all the other, um, both analog cables and the digital cables separate. Down here is the com actual computer. I know it's going to be hard to see, but I put it on a little roll around like a uh, skateboard so that if I ever need to, I can pull it, just roll this out. It rolls out on like an, um, I put an umbilical cord that's about three or four feet long and it pulls down. In the back, I don't know if you can see it, but the power cable and all the stuff going into the computer on our own one single cable. So I can just push back and in. I did that, sorry, I'm banging into the camera. I did that so that in case I have to roll this thing out here and put, do something else with it, I can do it. I have to open this and show you really quickly. I'm just popping the back, it's popping the side off. Okay, let's see, let's do it again. I need to get a little bit over here. Okay. okay. If you look, on this side of this computer is soundproofed. The whole inside of it is soundproofed. It's really well done. It has extra quiet CPU fan, a giant fan. If you see this huge thing I'm pointing to, if you could see it, it's about a eight inch by eight inch square and all it is is the main CPU fans and they're soundproofed. So it's a very quiet machine and it has all, all uh, quiet SSD non-rotational drives for the main system. So they're dead silent. They're you know, nothing but memory chips. And it has some very large, very quiet rotational drives to store all the various data that I do. And uh, DJ X <laughs> built this thing for me. He designed it. Um, in the 80s, I used to own a computer company, and I've probably built over a thousand computers myself easily. And I can tell you, I always took great care with every computer I built. I tied down every wire, I zip tied everything. It looked, <laughs> when my computers were done, they were beautiful. This is just like that. He's done such a great job. All the cables go up in behind in little tubes up around to everywhere they have to go. It's just beautifully done. And it's all in a big fractal case, which is, you know, made to be perfect. It's a beautiful thing. Anyway, that's why I have it on a, on a dolly so that I can pull it in and out and maybe put new equipment in, whatever I have to. I don't have to tear apart the whole system. You see, it just slid, slid right back under the table very easily now. Okay. Last thing is that the room is... Uh, it's kind of nice. It's got a fireplace on the right of the U. In the back of that, the bottom part of the U has a fireplace. Over the right of that is a set of drums that I played, you know, I, up until COVID hit, I was playing with a band in town that was very, very good. These are like a, a, a full handset, uh, like uh, conga, has some smaller drums, it has cymbals, a bunch of percussion, but it's, it's an, an amazing hand drum set. And I don't have to carry around a big kit anymore, a huge, a huge drum set. So it's really nice. I, I can't wait till the real COVID scare is over and we can start playing again. Um, this room is small. Oh, I'm sorry. Hit the camera person here. By the way, my camera person is my sister. She's a doctor. She's a wonderful person for doing this. At least I know I'm not going to be aiming at the wall. I should be aiming at the equipment. At any rate, I just banged into her and I'm, I apologize. Um, the back wall there is very empty now and what I plan to put up there are some panels that deaden sound or I can liven sound. They're called clouds or baffles. You could put some clouds on the ceiling. By putting things in the right place 
and tuning the room, I can make this room sound like every other great studio in the world or control room. In other words, you tune a room to equalize all the sound so that when you make a recording, you can be pretty sure that if you play it in another control room somewhere else, it's going to sound about the same because you've tuned each frequency to be as uh, at the right level, let's put it that way. And there are, there are ways to do it, and it's just something I really love playing with. I spend a lot of time at tuning rooms. I've designed a couple different, what they call world-class studios. If you're a world-class studio, you can bring anything made there to another world-class studio and expect it to sound just like it did, you know, wherever you were. If you're in London, you go to Paris, the, the sound at least sounds the same. Otherwise, everything would be crazy. You'd, you'd think you had the greatest recording in the world in London, and when you brought it to San Francisco, it would sound like junk. So at any rate, I intend to make this room sound good, even though it's not a true recording, soundproofed recording control room, I'm going to make it sound as best I can for a residential living room. In other words, it's got a fireplace in it. It's like anyone has a, in their own house, they put a subwoofer. I put a subwoofer on the side of the, the big U-shaped desk. I put two very available, very accessible JBL speakers here that any family, if they have good sound, can purchase these things and have the same kind of sound that I'm, I'm shooting for. Most control rooms have some giant speakers that are trying to imitate a big dance floor or whatever. I don't need to do that. I just want things I make to sound good in people's homes, in their cars, on headphones, etc. Uh, the rest takes care of itself. At any rate, I, last thing, as I move out, I'm going to point to one last thing. I'm, I'm walking out of the U now. To the left of this U is a, a, an old 19-inch style rack, and it on the it has a big patch bay, which is a group of holes. You know, people see them as a huge bunch of holes. What they are, are all the inputs and outputs of the analog equipment in the room is brought to the back of this patch bay. So if I want to get into a piece of equipment that's, you know, 20 feet over in another direction, I find its inputs and outputs right here somewhere. And I can connect them to the Soundcraft mixer or connect the keyboard, which is, you know, whatever I have to do, I can go through this patch panel to make changes. This whole U-shaped desk is all locked down because it's, it's infrastructure. It's never going to change. But this sound bay, this patch bay lets me change stuff that does have to change every day. In a recording studio, you change things all the time. But that's what lets me do it over here. Down at the bottom of this thing is an actual turntable. I have a very old Technics turntable that is fantastic. It just still works great. It's got to be 40 years old. Fantastic, fantastic piece of equipment. On top, I have a, another really great piece of equipment that I put in every studio. Um, this is an eight channel direct box. It's, it not only does the, the direct box function of converting uh, high beans to low beans, things like that. It has a, a couple, uh, fil has a filter on each thing and some, um, it, it will uh, let, allow me to increase um, the sound, dampen the sound or, or relax it. It's, it's a very nice thing, uh, all eight channels together. You don't have eight, eight direct boxes all around your floor with their own wires. You can just get them from the studio into the patch bay and then right into these direct boxes and adjust their level and filter their sound from here. It's a very nice piece. Um, below that, I have two great, uh, another pieces there. These are pre-sonas. That direct box is actually by Behringer. Now they generally just make com commercial equipment. Um, you know, for, for people not pro equipment, they make, uh, they make some pro equipment, but basically they're a, uh, a home oriented or low level, uh, stuff and it, I know that's that's the image I have. Maybe it's not right, but they they make very good direct boxes. Is all I could tell you. They they just work great. And meanwhile, this is a PreSonus set of headphones, which there are six channels here on the top and six on the bottom. By plugging them into the patch bay and out that goes out around to the studio to the control room uh, into the uh, sound room. I can give up to six, up to 12 musicians a different mix in their headphones. In other words, the bass player wants to hear one thing and the drummer wants to hear another thing and so forth. 
it's all uh, adjustable here. And if someone says, make me louder in my headsets, I can make him louder in his headsets without making him louder in everyone else's. Each one of 12 people get a separate mix in their headphones. That's what this is about. So I've kind of tried to put all the real basics that I need in not only a control room, but a basic rehearsal studio too, a rehearsal uh, sound room. And if I do it right, I should be able to make some very good recordings here. I hope to. There are some great musicians in Tucson, and once it's all together, I'll start inviting them here to play along and see what we can do. At any rate, that's it. I, I'm going to be very slow at answering questions. I'll put this up on the list here, the Dancing Dots list. Again, I want to thank DJX. His name is uh, Xavier Piguero. He lives in Cleveland, and if you need a workstation built for blind, for blind people, he's the first person you should call. He's forgotten more than most of us know. And he's, he's young, he's in his 30s. It's amazing what he has under his belt. He's good, he's got it all covered. Uh, not only computers, but music. He's just an all around guy when it comes to music and engineering. And I really liked working with him. And I, I now have to enlist his aid to teach me how to use all this stuff. I used to run boards visually. And now that I'm totally blind, I have to learn the procedures for doing it all through sonar and cake talking, which I did get a course from Dancing Dots. They're, by the way, last thing, because I am blind, I have to use sonar. There's a newer set of uh, software out there. There's Reaper, there's Sample, there are all these great new um, song, you know, digital rendering music software pieces. But that software would take me months and months and months to learn. I already know sonar, at least visually, when I was partially sighted, I could at least see what I was doing a little bit, I got to really like sonar and being totally blind, I still can use it fairly easily. Um, having to ramp up to something new, I wouldn't be able to do very easily. I'm getting old, I'm 73. However, knowing that I don't have to spend time on learning all those new keystrokes and whatever is giving me uh, a lot more time to do other things. But what, by the way, the sonar, it doesn't use current software it doesn't use current operating systems like the windows 10 you can't run sonar and cake talking on a windows 10 system because the gentleman who designed all the uh the jaws uh scripting for the thing to make it work uh david pinto he used to he worked with uh, dancing dots quite a while and they developed developed it all to be an amazing program but it relied on the Windows Classic color scheme, which Microsoft just dumped on Windows 8. So all of a sudden, sonar and cake talking can't be used past Windows 8. So I went to the trouble of checking with DJX and saying, Xavier, what, what can I do about that? I still want to run the older sonar. And he said, if you hurry, you can get a very old motherboard, what we would consider old now, it's from 20, you know, 18 or 17, it's four or five years old now, but it's very well optimized for running Windows 7, which does have Windows Classic, and so I can run the program I need to on a highly optimized board with a great CPU, and it, it was nice to know that he knows the difference. And also, the actual, I lost my train of thought, but the computer that we use, um, it's dual booted so that if I, when I turn it on, I leave it on all the time generally and in, in up and running in sonar, but when I turn it on, I can either boot it into Windows 7 from Microsoft and run all my music stuff, or I can tell it to boot up in Windows 11, which is the latest Windows software, and then I could run anything like Reaper or Samplitude or any other new software program that I want. But right now I'm so happy I get to continue using sonar and everything it does and i hope to have this whole place really functional and running soon is xavier call me we're going to start making some uh tutorials time available now that i built all i didn't tell you by the way but i did put the whole desk together i had to make the floor because the glass floor i wanted was way too much money they wanted 1400 dollars for this kind of size floor so instead i went to lowe's and i got some big pieces of plywood and we cut them to the right size and I laid some nice vinyl wood over that and it just all looks so great. It, you know, 
Am I right, Donna? My sister doesn't Absolutely. look. Absolutely. It looks nice. It's she, beautiful. I paid her to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. This took me months. Would you say a year? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Months and months and months to do. But it was so worth it because I'm comfortable now, finally, in one place. I'm not going to trip over wires. They're all nailed down and they're not even visible. And I can tell you that is an achievement. I cut all the wires to the right size. You know, I put the connectors on the end. Uh, if the wire had to be 14 feet long, I made it that long. And this is talking about every cable, all the audio, MIDI cables, everything. They all fit and they fit really great. Now I just hope it all works and you, know, you never know. I also put electric under the bottom on it. You saw it when we looked under the desk, obviously. You know, I didn't tell you about it, but I put a four box of 120 volts and two 10, 10 receptacle strips under each side of the U, so I could plug in a lot of extra equipment and I'm running direct lines to the electric so it's all nice and clean power and will set won't add anything to the sound at all. At any rate, that's it. I have a great workstation. Now all I want to do is get to where I can use it. Thanks. I hope this wasn't too boring for you. Let me know. Uh, I, I did want to tell you I won't be responding very quickly because I have a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, if you have questions, I'll try and answer them. But you see me rarely on the list responding to stuff. But send me whatever you got. I'll try and answer it. Take care. Thank you.